let's see how to do stereo matching. And as I just suggested, stereo matching and motion estimation have, are very similar because they're basically solving the same problem. In one case, you have a static camera and a moving world. In the other case, you have a static world and a moving or two cameras that are displaced relative to each other. And for now, let's go ahead and continue to assume that the, the camera is displaced in a very special way, which is they're just offset. Think the two eyes here where the eyes are just translated. I don't have one eye above the other eye. They're translated relative to each other. And that's a very, very special geometry that allowed us to derive that relationship between Z equal to FB, focal length baseline, divided by disparity. And the reason why we had that is when the cameras are parallel to each other, I had those similar triangles. If the cameras are offset or rotated, while well, the world is going to look a little different, we'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, let's assume we have two cameras offset from each other looking at the world with parallel optical axes. Now the question is, given a point um, in one image, where is the corresponding point in the other image? And that will give me the disparity. So we could just go back, let's, let's do the feature tracking. We could do this differentially, but let's just do the feature tracking. So I give you a point in the, say, the left eye, and I ask, where is it in the right eye? Okay, take a little patch of pixel intensities, take a little patch of image gradients, take a little patch of hog descriptors, and go hunting for it in the other image, and find me the correspondence. And do that pixel after pixel after pixel, you will get a series of estimates of disparity. If you know the focal length and the baseline, you can estimate Z um, explicitly. Now, where do you look? Well, in motion estimation, we said, well, we don't know. We don't know where something moved. It moved left, it moved up, it moved down. We don't know how far it moved. But in stereo imaging, you actually have some constraints because we know that the camera is translated relative to each other. And that constrains where a point can be between the left eye and the right eye. So look here, I've taken a point on the kickstand and I've drawn a dashed line across both images and notice that the corresponding point between the two eyes, left and right eye, lies along a single horizontal scan line. That's not an accident. Take another point here on the bench in the background and the corresponding point is along a single horizontal scan line. It is guaranteed because of that parallel offset. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If I take an image and I, and I have two cameras like this and I'm looking directly out, if I was shifted, well, who knows? If it was rotated, who knows? But if they're simply translated, well, then whatever shows up here is going to have to show up in the same vertical location across the two images. And so that means that um, similarly up here, something in the way background is going to be along the same parallel line. And that means we can do feature tracking much more efficiently. We start at one point in the image and we simply scan a single horizontal scan line, the same horizontal scan line across the image, and we don't have to search up and down. And we do the same feature tracking that we did with motion estimation. Pick your favorite representation, pixels, color, gradients, hog, I don't care, and find me the most similar uh, location between the two images. That will give me disparity, and from disparity, I get depth. Now, the world isn't always as nice as parallel cameras. So when you have parallel cameras, as I'm showing you here, you have a point out in the world, and that point and the aperture and the aperture, the pinhole corresponding to the two cameras here, form a plane. That plane intersects the two imaging planes shown in yellow here, and will be will create a horizontal line across the two, and that's where the, the point must be imaged. So this is just a little geometric construction to show you why that horizontal constraint works. Take that point and it must go through that aperture that I'm showing you in yellow. Since that defines a plane, those three points, that plane intersects the two sensor planes and it intersects them at exactly the same horizontal line. And therefore a point in this image must be on a horizontal line and a point in that image. Now, the world isn't always that nice to us, either intentionally or unintentionally. So for example, if I've got a stereo rig on a moving car, maybe I, I bolt the cameras down like this, but maybe they move a little bit. The car's going down the highway at 80 miles an hour, they rotate a little bit, they jiggle a little bit. Maybe that constraint isn't quite so good. Or maybe by design, you wanna rotate the cameras in so you can see very, just directly in front of you and you don't care so much about what's going way far down the road. And now the geometry is a little bit different. So I've got the point in the world, 
I've got my two uh, pinholes associated with the camera shown in yellow here. And now notice that this plane intersects the sensors along diagonal lines, not horizontal lines. This is the so-called epipolar plane. And these lines in the image are the so-called epipolar lines. You are guaranteed that a point in this image will lie on a line here corresponding to the epipolar line, but here's the rub. You need to know how much the cameras are rotated relative to each other, which requires camera calibration of some sort. And so the, conceptually, this is a very simple one-dimensional search problem. In practice, however, this can get complicated if you don't know exactly where the cameras are relative to each other, or if they shift over time just because of the sort of non-rigid nature of things even when you bolt them down. But the good news is we basically have a feature tracking problem. And so all you have to, the trick here is to figure out how to do this computationally uh, efficiently. And the standard way to do that is either to always have parallel or nearly parallel cameras and search on horizontal scan lines, or maybe up and down just a little bit in order to deal with uh, slight inconsistencies in the alignment of the camera. But the beautiful thing now is from just two images with two cameras, um, you can now remove the ambiguity. We remove the size ambiguity and we move, remove the speed ambiguity. Things that are big and far will now be imaged on the two eyes differently than something small and near. Things that are fast and far will be imaged differently than things that are slow and near. And so these two eyes give you a huge amount of information, but it comes at an expense. You need two cameras on your rig. You now have to process two um, streams coming out. You've literally doubled the expense, but it's a huge win computationally if you are trying to reason about 3D scene structure, 3D geometry of the scene. You want to image the world either from a moving camera or from this type of rig. And again, it's important to understand that motion and stereo are just two sides of the same coin. Stereo is you have a static world and a moving or displaced camera. Motion is you have a static camera and the world is moving, but the underlying techniques, the differential techniques, the feature tracking techniques, whatever techniques they are, are essentially the same because you're solving the same geometric problem to remove ambiguity and reason uh, more about the three-dimensional world that you're imaging.